Hello, everybody. I'm Jim Wasley. I'm, I'm the purported host of this event. And John Jansen, who just joined me, is the other Milwaukee participant. He's down at the School of Freshwater Sciences. I'm uh, in my home, which I haven't left for the last nine months, um, but I teach in Milwaukee. And I'm going to turn it over to Aaron and Mary. It's really their party. Um, so I'll take it away. And I want to welcome everybody to our first virtual watermarks walk. Um, this has been the year of firsts, and this is a first for us, and we look forward to having two dynamic speakers who are going to lead us down uh, Greenfield Avenue for a walk that they've entitled Greenfield Avenue, Gateway to the Harbor. Really excited to focus on this walk again along Greenfield, starting at Freshwater Plaza. We're going to make our way down to uh, the harbor itself. Jim, take it away. Oh, thank you, Aaron. But I want to show you a one-minute video to, I, I realized just as I was watching you all enroll that a lot of you probably aren't in Milwaukee, haven't been here. I'll try to give you a bit of grounding, but we're just taking a two block walk. So we're not going to learn about the whole city. Um, still, let me just start with this video. And I'm not getting any sound, but I hope you are. If you're not, the sound really doesn't matter. It's a short. And Jim, for context, for the, the people who aren't familiar, this is the Freshwater Plaza. This is Freshwater Plaza. And um, yeah, I, I will set context up. I just wanted to give you some moving pictures. We had intended to have a lot of video integrated with this and we just didn't get it together. Okay, that was Freshwater Plaza. Now let me take you there in a different mode of transit. So here we are um, at Freshwater Plaza, which is this new development that you just saw the video, the fountain you see in the right hand side of the image. Um, and the big letter F is one of Mary's proposed um, markers. So this is the first stop along the tour. Um, this is a proposal, the marker isn't in yet, it probably will be located just down the street from here, but this gives us a, a starting point. Um, and you've seen the fountain. And I want to call attention to um, the kiosk of the fountain, which has a map that students of mine milled out of a piece of aluminum. And we still haven't finished the interpretive signage, so nobody knows what that map means. But what that map is really talking about is the inner harbor of Milwaukee. So we are right here and we are on the intersection of First Street and Greenfield Avenue. And you can see Greenfield Avenue dead ends here at the harbor. This is all a new development. Uh, and this is the UWM School of Freshwater Sciences. And that's where John is sitting down in an office right down here. And so we are walking from here to here. We're gonna take a brief detour to the back of this slip. This is Greenfield Slip. And that slip is the reason the school is here. This is, this is really a uh, cowboy outpost of UWM, which is off the map to the north. But the freshwater sciences People are down here because they have a slip, they have a boat, they have immediate access to the lake. They have a uh, you know, tremendous resource and the ability to move around. And what I wanna call your attention to as part of this walk is really this line. This is the railroad, this is the Amtrak line. If you are from here, this is the Amtrak and I just got it in the wrong track, but that'll take you down to Chicago, that'll take you to Minneapolis. Uh, but what it won't, or what it does, is it creates a wall. And that wall really separates the industrial area of the harbor. This is all brownfield that's in the process of being redeveloped from the city proper. And the projects that I'm talking about are driven by the fact that 
this School of Freshwater Sciences has existed for a long time, but the state recently built a new laboratory down there. And as part of that lab, I was commissioned to design a master plan for this walk. So we're standing here at the corner. Everything about this master plan is trying to overcome the sense that the right-hand side of the page is cut off from the left-hand side of the page. We're really trying to reconnect the city together. And the goal is to do that by doing things with water, by featuring water. We're gonna talk about the water at the back of the slip. We're gonna talk about the water of this fountain feature here. And so that's my research. I'm an architect, I'm an urban planner. I designed this walkway. Um, let me introduce John, who's the guy talking to the guy in the funny mask here. Well, I work, I call myself a food web ecologist, but I tend to work on fish. And that photograph was taken by one of my students. Uh, we were looking for smallmouth bass spawning nests. And the thing about a smallmouth bass is the male defends the nest very, very aggressively. And right towards the back end of the fish where you see it's got its sort of blackish fish, there are smallmouth bass eggs there. And he's concerned that I'm going to disturb his nest. And if I were to get much closer, he would actually whack me in the, in the face mask there, um, which would be okay. I'm used to that. So, but I never knew that he took this photograph, but I thought that says a lot about the fish. I don't know about me. So, but that's, I mean, this is, um, this is South Shore. We're close to an industrial harbor and you've got, what's one of the top sport fish uh, in the country in good abundance there <laughs> and making yeah, that, more of them. That's part of the story here. I mean, our, our interaction is really that I'm an ecological designer and that fountain I'm gonna tell you about in a minute is really meant to be an ecological demonstration project. And John is the actual ecologist. So he, he's the one who tells me <laughs> that I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, I wanted to remind people since uh, Mary didn't show this. These are the, the markers that are going in on, on Greenfield Avenue. Uh, I, you said three, Mary. I don't know which one you were taking out of the mix, but we're starting here at Live, moving to learn and uh, play would be, oh, I did wanna, and I can back up uh, just because Mary mentioned it. This is the Jones Island wastewater treatment plant. This is where all of the sewage for the inner city gets treated and the stack, you can't even see it. It's not casting a shadow, but I'm guessing it's that. It was a very tall smokestack. And so that will be our destination topic, I suppose. The fourth stack, uh, the fourth mark marker will come later. So we okay. haven't lost it. Okay. So here, just a little bit about what you can't see about the fountain on any given day, but you would see if you happen to be there at just the right time. It is a stormwater fountain that is driven by the water that comes off the roof of the building. It's trying to keep that water out of the sewer system of the city, which is uh, overstressed, old combined sewer system. So this is the fountain uh, in its rain mode. And it actually has a massive cistern under it. So the water that you see is only about half of the water that is cycling through the fountain. That is what the storage capacity for stormwater, which is about two inches of rain off of the roof of the building. And the idea is that that water's circulated around up through these planter boxes, which if you have an aquarium are like sand filters. They're natural filters that are meant to take the nutrients out of the water, the excess phosphorus and nitrogen from the seagulls pooping on the roof of the building. Um, and clean it so that we don't need to use chemical treatments. So this is an ecological fountain feature, but as you can see in the first year of operation, the plants aren't well established. I mean, this is what we're supposed to be treating against, that it's right here uh, been overtaken with algae growth. Uh, there are a lot of excess nutrients in the water. And so it's turning into a kind of um, algae filled pond. That's not aesthetically what the clients wanted, what the clients wanted, what I want to see, and why I'm so interested in talking to John is that uh, he knows how to, what makes that stream 
run clear. This is a spring fed stream, not far from where we are now in Milwaukee. Uh, and so John, what is it that makes that stream run clear? What, what makes it run clear are things that, well, most people wouldn't notice. The people who would notice are uh, people who are fly fishers. Because one of the things that a fly fisher, this would be a small stream dug, too small to fly fish. But one of the things that a fly fisher does first off is to pick up one of those rocks in the water to look at the bugs that are on it. So those rocks are covered with bugs. And a lot of those bugs have things like nets that they use to filter the water. So when you see clear water stream, what I see, you may see the clear water, the, the fly fisher sees the rocks and he sees the bugs that are gonna be on those rocks. And then he picks up a rock to see what's on that rock uh, and then picks what fly he might be using. So if you've seen the river, the movie, A River Runs Through It, that kind of stuff is going on in that movie. It's one of the, the subtleties of the movie that, that I really, really like. But it's the animals that are in the water that make the water clear. Right. Get so rid of the animals and it's a mess. So what I, I got out of sequence on was to say, well, here we are today and it's actually cold and gray. And this was a month ago, but we were still too late to see the fountain running. They had just turned it off for the winter. It was designed to run year round, but the owners of the development uh, don't trust it. So they drain it for the winter. Um, and John, here you are talking about the bugs. What the heck are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> so, so back up to me with my peculiar hand posture. What I was saying was that one of the interesting bugs that colonized the, the feature that actually really surprised, surprised me was the, the maggot, the larva of black flies. And people pretty much don't like black flies because they will bite you and suck your blood and make you all sorts of itchy and everything. But if you go back down to the, the black fly maggot there, which is just, it's less than an inch long, those fans over by, hopefully you can figure out where the head is. It's got two little uh, eye spots on either side, but those fans, those are as antenna. And that's how it filters the water to take little particles out of that. And um, if we went back to, to the video where there was a waterfall, that's where you'd find this bug is right in the waterfall with the fans in the flowing water, pulling all sorts of stuff out of the water. Uh, and this in a clean stream would be one of, I don't know, 10, 15 different species that are filtering the water in different ways. Some of them build nests. Some of them have fans on their antennae like this. Some of them have fans on their front legs, like one of the more interesting uh, mayflies. So, and an interesting thing is that the novice going to a stream and picking up a rock will generally not see these things. They're cryptic. They're cryptic because they don't want to be eaten. And <laughs> After about 15 minutes, and I've done this with students quite a bit, they start to see, oh, there was something moving. Oh, oh, there's bugs. And another 15 minutes and they're saying, oh my gosh, this rock is crawling with bugs. How come I never saw that? And then that changes their whole perception. So I think Mer Mary can relate to this, that like once you start to see something, then you see it a lot. Uh, and that's what happens with somebody investigating a stream. Once you start to see the bugs, you see that there are a lot of them all over the place. And that is important. That's what cleans the stream. John, can I, can I interrupt and ask you a question that's coming in from the chat? Just to sure. go a, a little bit more specifically into how, and I, I know you sort of just touched on this right now, but how do different animals keep the water clean? And why, why are the rocks so important? not just in terms of the, the bugs, but just the rocks in general, or bugs being covered on the rocks? Well, the, the cleaning is by, they're the filtration system. And it's not just the bugs, it's, it's the clams. Okay, in a clean stream, um, well, if you, if you go to the Milwaukee River and, and see some uh, exposed gravel bed, 
you'll see a lot of clamshells. You don't see the live ones. They're, they're kind of hidden down in the, in the mud or the gravel or depending upon the, the species of, of clam, but they do a lot of filtration and there can be, excuse the metric system, there can be 10 to 15 clams per square meter, okay, or per square yard. So that's a lot, but they're cryptic. You don't, you don't really notice them. Um, so, and why the rocks? Well, if you're gonna hold a net out in, into the water, you need something stable for it to attach to. And where you find rocks is generally where the water flow is the fastest. So you're gonna get the most flow going through your, your net or your fan or something like that. So, but there is filtration going on in, in uh, the mud beds too. Uh, it's just not as much water flow and it's a whole group, different uh, number of species in that mud. And John, I put this image in here because the other- You're just hold on, I got a, there's a lights or an occupant sensor in here and I have to move now and then. So, uh, but I'll come back. Yeah, the other, well, it fits that you are saying this in the dark because the other reason that the algae grows is that there's a lot of sunlight. And so that um, the natural stream that was running so clear is supporting dense vegetation all around it. And that canopy builds up over it and fully shades it. And that is part of the equation that we can only hope in 20 years, this thing will be leafed out. Uh, the trees will be bigger and there will be more shade because until the shade is gone, the equation is all to say, let's, let's party, let's grow. Is that correct, John? Yeah, and actually to add to that, um, <laughs> so I, I teased Jim that he didn't put enough trees in here, but these birch trees will grow and shade it out. But that's another interesting thing that uh, the public generally doesn't know about, about streams, at least small streams around here, which is the major source of raw food for the stream is actually what's going on right now is the leaf fall uh, in the autumn. And that'll eventually wash into the stream and it forms what's called leaf packs. And if you go into a stream in January, February, March, and pull apart those leaf packs, you'll find it crawling with insects that are, are chewing it to pieces. So a nice clean stream, an upstream one, uh, you might think, well, it's cold in the summer, it's gonna be 45 degrees. It's 45 degrees in the winter too, because it's spring fed. So the bugs don't care uh, that it's winter, it's still warm to them. But they process the leaves and that's part of what keeps a, a, a stream clean. So right now, while well, you showed that first summer with all the algae, um, you could get rid of the algae by having more tree shade, which blocks the sunlight. Uh, we could have put crayfish in there, which would eat the algae. We could have put a little minnow in there called stone rollers that would eat the algae. Our fear about that was that maybe we would attract too many raccoons and that could be a problem. <laughs> um, so, you know, urban semi-wilderness, it includes all those things that, uh, yeah, raccoons can carry rabies. <laughs> so maybe we don't want that. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll, we'll come back to that theme, but let's take a walk. Wait, Jim, um, one, one second before we move past. There's a good question here about monitoring and the, the adaptation of the piece, uh, the fountain itself, and some of the technology that goes behind it. Uh, <laughs> that's a really great question. I, I have been, ever since we got it built, which was um, paid for by the city through a TIF because of the redevelopment, the, the idea was, this viaduct really does cut the school off and my intent and the fountains um, kicking it off was to, to create a, a more appropriate gateway to the school. But once it was built, uh, I have not been able to find any money to monitor it. Uh, the technology that was sort of interesting and involved that we ran for a year before the funding ran out was uh, a valve on the storage cistern that would dump the cistern in with predictive weather data. So it's talking to the cloud and it's saying, oh, it's gonna to rain tomorrow and it's expected to rain an inch. I will drop an inch of rain out of the cistern to make space. So that dynamic storage management means that we can keep a lot more water around longer because 
if the fountain is not being supplied by rain, it is evaporating water constantly. And so what you don't want to have happen is that it runs dry and you're suddenly putting potable water into it. That is not an ecological solution at all. So the, the advance there was to try to say, we're going to actually control when the water leaves, not just let it passively leave slowly over time, but we're going to actively open and close a valve. Uh, and that technology exists and it's actually a New York City company that was contracted to, to run that, I think, through the sewage district. Uh, and I hope that answered the question, which is unfortunately we don't have any good answers. So we'll continue walking down um, Greenfield and you can see the viaduct that sets the, the tone. John, the black fly in the lead. And on the other side, we're going to see the school in the distance, but we'll take a, a quick detour to the left here and um, stop at the back of the slip. So my involvement with the slip was to say, uh, John tells me that slip could be great habitat, already is in some ways good habitat. Why don't we actually make habitat back there as a public um, habitat garden, a place that you could have a, an observation point. And so that was one of the water features along the way. And uh, so now, John, your take on the back of the slip and habitat. Okay. Did you insert the pike in here or not? I will go to that. Oh, that <laughs> one. Okay. Yeah. I mean, this is actually about a 10 year old, old picture, but Jim had this great workshop um, summer of 2019 about um, well maybe you want to talk about it a little bit that urban it was a habitat. NSF workshop looking at water systems in these port cities around the Great Lakes Basin and we were talking about land water interface issues and um, so John brought some of the participants back to the back of the slip here right but actually that was a little bit later but at some point, uh, um, well, I was making the point that you may not think there's habitat out there. It looks like all that iron wall and et, et cetera, you being a terrestrial being, but that doesn't mean the fish don't recognize habitat. And I said, for example, at the west end of the slip, we'll go out there and, and catch pike. And it's pretty much predictable that we'll get one or two pike inside of 15 minutes. So at that point, I, I contacted uh, a couple of my students and I said, can you guys just go back to the west end of the slip and come back with a pike and a cooler? Um, and they came back 15 minutes later. They said, yeah, we got the pike on the second cast. <laughs> and it was too big to put in the cooler. So we just took a picture of it. So I gave Jim this picture from 10 years ago of, of one of the pike from back there. So apologize that, that the people in my lab tend to catch unusually large fish too big to bring back. But at any rate, and this pike was back in the water a couple minutes later. It's important to keep big predators in the, in the harbor. So at any rate, we give him a kiss and put him back in the water. Yeah, so that, um, and to, to finish the story of my involvement, the tank farm, which is the asphalt supply for all of Milwaukee and the roads between here and Madison, um, didn't want to cooperate with this. The slip is split down the middle in terms of property ownership. And so the second design was half as wide and twice as long and was based on the idea that this dock wall is actually collapsing. And so there's state money somewhere sometime to rebuild it. So we went down to look at the collapsing dock wall. And so I, yeah, so um, probably the wrong time of year to do this. Um, but right in the center there, the, the long blade like leaves, that's from uh, our largest native uh, iris, iris versicolor. Uh, and if you put a picture in there, did you insert a, I, you had that before. Yeah, that's it. You've probably seen it. Uh, it's cultivated to have sometimes yellow flowers, et cetera. But um, in late June, early July, you would see that flowering coming out of that old uh, eroding um, wall. 
So it, it's a little a bit like Jurassic Park, life finds a way. And I, and it's a problem for us that the wall's collapsing, but I'm kind of delighted and giggling that this is taking advantage of it. Yeah, it's, it's creating a wetland between the wall and the, the land. Yeah, a small little pocket wetland. So that brings us down to the School of Freshwater Sciences um, and another of Mary's markers. And what we're seeing here is the, the new laboratory building that all of this is uh, really built in relation to. The old building, which was a, a 1970s era tile factory um, doing high-end architectural tile that was um, a product of, I think, the company that was Rockwell before Rockwell bought Rockwell. Um, the point is that they, they made high-end architectural tiles from Italy for about a year and then they decided it was a bad business idea and they sold the building to the university for a dollar. At least that's the story, that's about 1970. And so John and, and cowboys like him have been down in this old hulking factory running a Great Lakes research facility for the last 40 years and now have an actual school. My work was to say, let's bring that water feature down, uh, do something to the school. So you remember at the fountain, seeing this sluice, which is taking water off the building. The idea at the school is to have a, a twin brother sluice, twin sister sluice. I haven't decided that it's gender, but it is uh, identical. And it actually has been fabricated for the last three years. I've just been hit against red tape trying to get it installed. But here, this is a rain garden that drains the roof of the new building that was done by uh, the architects and the, the ecologists that we both know, um, Steve Affelbaum of Applied Ecological Services. Um, so that's an existing rain garden. And the idea here is to take not rainwater, but actually aquaculture discharge water from the labs that John and other people run where inside this building, are massive tanks where they're growing pike and uh, sturgeon and other lake fish and developing food. Uh, and maybe you could talk a little bit about what goes on inside the building, John. I didn't, we didn't put slides in to, to capture that idea, but. Right, there's too many things going on inside the building for me to do it all, but there is an aquaculture facility that, that deals with some uh, things under, under development that aren't aren't the things you would see uh, in the grocery store, uh, but we also have people that work on contaminants, um, work on well contaminants related to human uh, fecal waste, um, and there's several of us that go out on Lake Michigan on our ship. Yeah. So, there in a nutshell. And for me, the the interest here is that this is a rain garden. This is meant to take rain off the roof of the building and let it settle and clean and hopefully absorb into the soil before if it overflows, it enters the city. There's a culvert that runs down the center of the street and at the end of the street, it spills out into the harbor. So this is a cleaning up the roof water before it dumps in the harbor. This aquaculture fountain was really intended to be a habitat playground so that the fountain up the street, they really don't want us putting crayfish or other things in there. It's meant to be a, a decorative urban fountain in a fairly um, conventional aesthetic range. And the goal there is to push the ecology as far as possible and still have it look like a fountain. Here, the idea was John would have a pool of water that could grow anything that the students would care to cultivate. But the challenge is then, this was designed to drain separately and keep those two flows of water independent from each other. So here you see mock-ups being done. Students that work with me to build these things full size to figure out the size. Here's the reflecting pool or the habitat pools rim, which I got a grant for two years ago and got fabricated and it's now marooned in the courtyard of the School of Architecture. 
because two things have happened in the last couple of years as I've been trying to get this installed. Uh, the first is that the um, lake has suddenly, we've gone through a period of uh, cold winters that have kept ice on the lake. The lake hasn't evaporated like it would typically and the level has gone way up. So we're at lake historic levels, John, or close to historic levels? Yeah, close to historic levels. The last time the lake was this high was 1986, 1987. Yeah, so with the lake this high and a pipe between the lake and this garden, this is now a sesh wetland, meaning that every time the lake sloshes with the wind, water burps up into the garden, coming in the opposite direction that it would normally flow and fills the garden, making it a wet pond. Right, so sometimes that, that's just mud there. I've lost my light again. <laughs> um, well, let me speak for a minute. Uh, yeah, sometimes that's a mud bottom. 15 minutes later, it's it's got a foot of water in it. Uh, I, at least to tell the toad story. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, first off, the, the tall grassy stuff in there, that's that's more of the iris. It's not cattails. Um, but yeah, once this got the lake this got flooded. Um, uh, we started getting toads mating in there and, and their eggs deposited in there. And the first thing you notice, at least if you're like me and you notice these things, is is their trilling song. Uh, and I heard that probably when I pulled up my bike or my car or something like that. And I was like, oh, the toads are mating in, in Jim's wetland. This is really great. And so there were little tadpoles a uh, little black tadpoles, that's what toads have. Uh, and with toads, they will start growing legs in a matter of a couple of weeks. So a couple of weeks, really about a month after the, the toads were singing, there were little toads coming out of the wetland all over the place. Unfortunately, some of them sort of got smashed on the road, et cetera. But, uh, you know, if we get the rest of the area environmentally uh, landscape, there'll be toads all over the place. The other thing that occupied here this past summer, uh, probably related to COVID and we were somewhat locked out of the building, was uh, a pair of red-winged blackbirds. And I would have to go in the building with holding a stick over my head because they dive bomb you, particularly the male. And you go walking in and you're not paying attention, all of a sudden it's, it's whacked you with its feet <laughs> on on the top of your head. Um, so you carry a stick in, but that's okay. <laughs> and it was, it was nice to have the birds. The question is once once we're over COVID, if that's still flooded, will we still get the red wings there? Um, what drew yeah. the red wings were the insects that thrive in the pond? Right. Yeah, red winged blackbirds are marsh birds. You see them uh, on the side of the road, there's there's some kind of wet area there. So yeah, and there's a lot of bugs in there, a lot of um, dragonfly, the dragonfly babies are in the water, the adults are buzzing around, lots of other stuff. It's really good. Well, that so the, the challenge now for me is that um, not only is this flooded, which is an, in some ways an opportunity as far as the campus is concerned, they think, well, why don't we just have the fountain fall into the pond? That makes sense. From the other ecologist, Steve Affelbaum's mind, the person who did the planting, if this was a permanent fountain, it would become filled with cattails. The cattails are, uh, John, you're going to have to explain the uh, native invasive hybrid, but they're dominant. Whatever they are, they take over. And if the conditions are stable with a wet bottom pond, Steve would say, they're gonna become the dominant species. The goal here was always to create this difference, this um, different ecology side by side woven together. So if the fountain does end up moving, why does it have to move? It moves because the other thing that happened is the state finally uh, expressed its trepidation that somehow the fountain was gonna blow wind on people and that that was unacceptable. The reality is the whole thing is unacceptable to the person who uh, has to get it installed for me. And he's been doing everything he can to, to make sure it doesn't get installed 
But if he wants me to move it, I will move it. If we want to put the water into this fountain and still keep it separate from this water, that's the design challenge of the future. And so you'll have to come back in a year or two to see how we're able to pull that off. Um, but the goal is back at to, to keep this level of diversity going on so that yes, some years uh, it is wet and certain things grow. Some years it's dry and other things grow. And that would be the way that this would be if this were a natural sesh wetland, which is the kinds of wetlands that John has taught me surround the lake because as the lake sloshes, the land is either underwater or dry. Um, so it like the tides on the coasts, but really driven by wind across the lake. Fair enough? Fair enough. So let's pop down, uh, since we have a few more minutes, to the end of the street. Um, and I didn't think to put a picture of the smokestack in Mary, but there is a little plaza down at the street. This was anticipated by my master plan, but not really anything I had involved with. So I can't say much about it, except that we can walk down and John can interpret it for us. So um, John, what did you see that I didn't see down there? Uh, well, you see the bubbling water for kids to play in and you can see towards the bottom that there's some gravel there. and I, this is one of those things that maybe my eye and brain are too educated, uh, educated, but those rocks, they're all the same color because they have a brownish film on it. And that brownish film is a kind of mostly single celled algae called diatoms. Um, more specifically, this thing called navicula because it looks like little boats and because they actually move around sort of silly, uh, slowly, um, maybe silly too. But uh, you know, here I'm red, green, colorblind. Uh, but that ought to be some sort of brownish green on the the microscopic image. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the other thing is that, uh, and I wish I'd taken a picture of this, is that we we're talking about insects that just managed to show up. If you pick up on any one of those rocks, you'll see the the cases. Uh, that midge larvae make. So it's a whole another kind of fly. This isn't, uh, it's not a biting fly. You might, if you go biking along the lakefront, you might see clouds of these uh, and they might get in your eyes. So they get sort of a nuisance, but they, they actually don't feed uh, once they come out of the water. They just mate and die. And this is hugely important fish food. For baby fish in particular, almost everything that's close to the bottom feeds on, on midge larvae. And that includes such giant things as, as even the adult uh, sturgeon. That's what they feed on. And they're very, very abundant. And those things are cleaning the water. Yeah, so the other thing that is pretty evident when you look at this is that there is no algae growing, uh, to uh, not like the other fountain, and that your estimation, my estimation as well, that, that this must be treated in some way or running on city water, not so potable water, not um, water just recycled from the lake, which is only five feet away. Um, and that's an open question, but that is really the question because John tells me he's convinced that my fountain is being treated by the owners. Um, since I don't have the money to research it, I haven't been able to really follow up. I haven't wanted to pester them to say, are you treating this? If, if they're treating it, that's their fountain right now to treat. But the goal again is to figure out how not to need to treat it. So let me, uh, since we are about to close out, I'll just close with these images. This is a postscript, but this explains my interest and sort of sets up the challenge that maybe John and I can finish thinking about. This is a picture of a very large urban water feature called Potsdamer Platz in the heart of Berlin, uh, done by uh, Herbert Dreisaitl, who's a friend and colleague who's actually teaching a design studio virtually with me here this semester. And I was just doing crits with him an hour ago. Um, this is a really natural uh, environment, restful in the heart of a very busy city, but it's also a very urbane 
fountain that um, does what fountains do, plays with light and creates a sense of civic drama and all of that. And the point of setting that up is that um, it's also full of algae because it's German, it's Herbert's, and it does not use uh, chemical treatment of the water. None, uh, it's a very German thing not to, they don't treat their potable water supply. They think it's a little barbaric that we do, um, but they don't have any problem with a big urban fountain that has to be swept to have the algae cleaned out of it every so often because it looks less than pristine. So the, the question is, you know, what's the ecological sensibility that strikes the balance between health and uh, our aesthetic sense of what water should be in the environment? This is back to the fountain at Freshwater Plaza where we started a water lily um, in the middle of the summer. And this was my refutation to John saying, look, there's still, there was algae in the fountain. It's just not nearly as bad as it was the first year. Uh, is there a point that it stabilizes naturally even before we get all the shade trees grown in uh, and or how can we uh, how can we further that so I just leave with that problematic that uh, brings us both together and maybe people have a question or maybe John and I can debate that question some more but I'm curious what other people think about your aesthetic expectation of water in the urban environment is it gross to have it filled with algae I am gonna dive into a couple of the questions, but there was a question I wanted to challenge you both on that might be outside of um, either of your bailiwicks, but historically, do we know how much marshland was in the Milwaukee area and how much of Milwaukee used to look a little bit more of like a native version of some of the things we were talking about? Yeah, let me, uh, I could show you, I could, uh, let me just describe it. The, you saw in Milwaukee, the harbor is the confluence of three rivers, the gathering of rivers that essentially are coming down the bluff and then finding this break in the bluff and following through. And there was a big, and essentially it was a three mile long by half a mile wide. I believe I wanna say that's exactly uh, approximately something that my students could lay Central Park on. That is the Menominee Valley that was the industrial heart of the city that was all wetlands, it was all rice marshes, wild rice marshes, very abundant uh, fisheries. And this was a very heavily populated place before Western colonization. Uh, so it was the gathering of the rivers and there were many different um, indigenous tribes here and a lot of food uh, and the entire landscape. Everything that we were standing on was water. <laughs> John, you wanna add Marsh. to that? Um no, that's a, that's about right. It was a, a marshland, and actually a, a project that that's well, it's multiple groups working on in the neighborhood here is it's what's called the, the Grand Trunk uh, Wetland Area. Uh, so it's a restoration area. But about ten years ago, I was at a meeting about restorations in the Great Lakes, and I sort of thought I didn't have anything to contribute or whatever, but it was worth listening to. This was in Chicago. And this fellow said, throughout the Great Lakes, wherever you have a big harbor, well, there's no, there's no wetlands left because we put big harbors there, okay? For obvious economic re reasons. So one of the fun things for me ab about all this is, yeah, we want, we want people to have jobs, okay? Let's see what we can do in terms of mix, which is why Jim and I are having so much fun together. But, I realized that when the guy said that, I said, oh, well, in our neighborhood, there is an area that has trees that tolerate wet pretty well. Maybe I need to go over and look at that. And suddenly we did a, a class on it. This was before I had actually interaction with Jim much and came up with a preliminary design. And now things basically on the verge of, of construction. Um, so- This is a railroad yard that right. had an emergent wetland on it that was the last certified fragment of wetland. It was registered with the State Department of Natural Resources so that 
uh, it was protected, even though in reality it had emerged on top of the abandoned rail yard, which had been put on top of the original. Well, right. <laughs> so sort of the breakthrough on the whole thing was that EPA had a meeting in town and people were telling EPA about, about this potential wetland project. And so they said, can you give these guys a tour? So we, we parked at the gate to it and to the north of it was where uh, the people that maintained the harbor, the sheet piling and put rocks in, et cetera, all their materials were there. And I could, I could hear the mumbling behind me as we're walking. It's like, what's this about? There's nothing here, there's nothing here. But I had a point where I wanted them to stop and turn and look. Because what you had there was, it was a big pile of an, in, of an invasive grass called Phragmites. But you get rid of the Phragmites and you've got, you've got the irises and et cetera, et cetera. So all this mumbling, like, why are we wasting our time on this walk? And then I said, stop and look to the south. And there was literally an audible gas because all these ecological sorts, they could see what was there, the problems and everything, but they could see the potential. And it was like almost in instantaneous, like, yeah, we're gonna fund this thing. So, um, yeah, I'm People just need to be on, on the lookout for those sort of opportunities. I, I mean, they're happening in, in New York. I mean, you've already got Central Park, et cetera. Yeah. But if that's yeah, the school, ahead, sorry. Yeah, it's right there. That is the Grand Trunk Wetland. That This whole area is being restored. And it doesn't look like much on the map, but my first time, the first time, John, you took students and I there, uh, it was the late summer, the trees were in full bloom, and you get into the middle of that, and it's one of those experiences you have in the middle of an industrial zone in the heart of the city, and you feel like you're miles away from everything. So Yeah, the only, the only contact that you have is, is the industrial noise, the traffic going by, okay? But otherwise, it's like you could be yeah, in lots of wilderness area. So the, the only reason that I interact with Jim is really selfish, because I said, if we put a wetland here, we can get more pike in the harbor and we can increase my pike fishing. So everything that I'm thinking about in this whole thing is just to improve my fishing. I don't care about anything else. Relationships are inherently selfish, says John <laughs> Jansen. Right. Um, can I can I throw a couple things at you? I don't want to go too far over time. We're going to lose uh, a lot of people on this call, but there were a bunch of responses to the algae comment, and uh, I just wanted to read them off to everybody. Um, for mere looks in urban areas, algae doesn't look pretty, but ecology, it's a good thing, right? And then there's a second comment that says it's not gross to have some algae, but a stinky bloom is a different matter. Um, and then the final one is another version of a question is, um, algae plus emergent plants, terrestrial plants are okay, but algae in a sterile fountain wouldn't be good. So those are just a, a few of the responses. I don't know if either one of you guys want to field any of those responses or respond to them in any way, but I just want to share them with everybody on the call. Yeah, for me, the algae is like, we need to reconstruct the rest of the ecosystem to get the stuff that eats the algae. And like I said, I mean, it, it, if we put the crayfish in, if we put the stone roller minnows in, we could get rid of that algae easy. But the question is, are we creating something of a nuisance if we have too many, many raccoons coming around? And you know, they can be a hazard, particularly if they have rabies, they're aggressive. <laughs> so we don't want that. But yeah, yeah, I, I will say, bit. I've done case studies on projects like this all around. And this story I've heard more than once that, um, well, we could have put fish in it, but then we'd have raccoons. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want the raccoons, so we can't have the fish. So, we, um, right. <laughs> I, I do think it's to me. It's the interesting question is um, just testing the boundaries. As as people were pointing out, there are, there's a lot. There's too much, and there's just right. And maybe there's a combination of things that put it in context that takes you somewhere good in your mind. That a memory of a place that's more natural that would have those components. So. Um, I, I, I just trying to soften people up to the possibility that might be acceptable. I don't have an idea myself about how it works. I'm just trying to learn how it works 
by literally experimenting with it, seeing what happens, trying to imitate my Herbert Dreisaitl uh, friend and mentor in that sense. So John, that, that actually takes me to another question that came up in the chat just now about design approach. Um, and the question is, do you approach these designs with the goal of biodiversity, stormwater collection, or education in any specific hierarchy? Um, and or were these designs formalized from goals or do the designs themselves generate these goals? And then there's a really nice question about uh, red tape and why do clients put up so much red tape and not trust you? Well, I, yeah. I, I both of go, Jim. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer first. The, um, to me, the whole question of design is to combine these, to find the, the synergy between them. Um, so the reason this, this workshop that John was talking about was really trying to figure out what's the interface between people concerned with the ecology of the harbor, the habitat of the fish, people concerned with stormwater, because in the regulatory world, those things don't mix. And so you can see from the, the fountain at the school, I'm really interested in this question of how close can you put things so that they, they might aesthetically mix, but functionally remain separate. They might functionally mix in a way that actually improves their health rather than one degrading the other. The whole question with that wetland John was talking about was that the DNR in saying they wanted to develop it as a wetland did not want to use it as a stormwater strategy. Um, and yet the city needs stormwater to be taken care of there. How do we solve that conflict? So to me, the, the question is not, I mean, there are priorities, but it's really how do we get both to happen at the same time? John, you have a different take on that? Yeah, you're just so bloody pragmatic. You forget that I'm only doing this for the pike, right? <laughs> I mean, actually, a little more seriously. Um, I'm like actually serious about this. What, what motives made to me is astonishment. Okay, so so for perspective about that, I did four austral summers in Antarctica, which is like being on another planet just about. It's so different. I've been a half mile down in the ocean looking at amazing fishes. Okay, very few people have done that. I've been in Siberia. And, and, uh, my astonishment at those things is just about the same as finding the black flies on this waterfall. I'm just like, wow, look at that. There's, there's black flies there. And I don't know, I'm, my brain must be wrong. It gets astonished by simple things. But I think if people start to get astonished or enough of them get astonished at it what's living in places that they think or there's nothing living, um, we might take better care of the planet. Yeah. So here, here's sort of an example. This goes way back to me in, in, in grad school. So I was at Michigan State in grad school and there was a water fountain and they had a problem in that every summer it was predictable that somebody was gonna put a box of detergent in there and it was gonna bubble up. And this sounds like fun, right? Okay, it got solved very simply. They put fish in there and nobody wanted to hurt the fish. The other story John, <laughs> that, that I would like to tell about your work is that um, we, we are talking about the industrial harbor, still functioning industrial harbor of a port city. And um, at this conference that we held, John's presentation was about work that they've been doing to map the, the dock walls and the habitat and the fish that are really in the heart of the city like this. And where everybody that I'm involved with in the environmental side of things sees a food desert and a, and a kind of gauntlet for the fish to run between the lake and getting upstream, John finds, uh, well, you tell him what you find, John. <laughs> well, I think it's, you rethink the whole thing. Because you could say you have these really, this big polarization between people who would like say, well, we've got to bring that whole wild rice wetland back and, and get it back to nature, et cetera. And at the other extreme is like, no, this is an industrial harbor and we shouldn't worry about anything that's living in there. And 
I think the discovery, this this bit of astonishment that I'm that I'm talking about, is that there's this in between sort of situation, and that we can have interesting wildlife. There's interesting ducks in there in the winter, etc., uh, and interesting plants. Uh, and it's not going to be that original wetland, but it's still interesting, and you can still try to make it biologically healthy. The ch challenge is to make it biologically healthy when things are not quite natural. But just total, totally rethink the whole thing. Don't be so polarized. Uh, what we like to do is find out places that are working by accident. And then when can we replicate those? And so an, actually an example of this, and I feel like I'm going on too long, was that we were when we were mapping the harbor, we went back into this place called the Burnham Canal, which was totally industrial. Um, a super fun site. A super fun site, okay? Uh, but that's part of the mapping. And it's like, oh, look, at there's all these sunfish spawning here. And there was this slab of limestone from a rock wall that had collapsed. And there was a largemouth bass spawning on that. So they like to make little bowl-like depressions and then they put their eggs in them. Well, this thing had a natural bowl-like depression in it. And, and he was spawning back there. And he was, we know he produced babies because we saw them. So I did a presentation the next spring about that. <clears throat> and then I showed um, sort of a staircase at a different, another part of the harbor by Summerfest. And I said, and this was like in May or something like that. And I said, I wouldn't be surprised if we find a largemouth bass spawning on that. And lo and behold, a month later, there was a, a bass spawning on that. Okay. So that sort of staircase into the water was put there for aesthetic reasons, not for bass reasons, but the bass didn't care. Okay. So we can mix sort of things like that together. Um, and you know, in bird wise, we think of that, I think, Maybe it was the last slide for your show. I showed all these, these decorative birdhouses. We're used to that, okay? All the bird season cares about is that the cavity is the right size and the hole is the right size and it's the right height above the ground. Other than that, you can make it as silly as, as you want and decorative. So why can't we do that with the water? I, I love, I, I mean, I think we can, you know, ramble on and on about these things, but I love that, you know, unexpectedly, John, you became the speaker of inspired words and this notion of astonishment moving into 2021 is such a good note for us to kind of keep in mind. Keep your eyes open, look at the things you weren't necessarily noticing and appreciate them for what value they're actually providing and how to actually move things forward instead of just being stuck in our old ways. Seems like a great kind of recap of 2020 and a great forecast for 2021. Um, but I definitely want to, um, between Jim, John, and Mary, I want to give you all a chance to just, you know, maybe say something before we part, just as a, as a final word or just a head nod or whatever you want to do. And I want to thank everybody for being with us on this pseudo walk in virtual land. And um, yeah, just uh, just give us give us another note of inspiration to walk away with. I, okay, I, I get to go first. Oh, sorry, Mary. I I, I just I have to say this has really been wonderful. Uh, because this is what we want to do is to, you know, reveal and uh, get people curious about this world around them, uh, you know, inspire people, give them that sense of astonishment. And the thing that I really hope is that everybody who's listening to this will take the walk down Greenfield. Uh, if you're there in Milwaukee. If you're not in Milwaukee, this is the best we can do. But uh, I think it, you'll be really interested to be able to go with this kind of these ideas and this thinking in your head as you're looking at things. Right. So I think Jim should close. So I will just say that the video that's been edited, the raw video is almost two hours long. <laughs> it took us two hours to cover what was going on biologically in those. Don't get people's expectations. Up to huh? It's also shot by somebody who doesn't know what he's doing. And the, an hour of it was 
uh, the camera following my feet because it was on when I was walking. It's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> right. But nonetheless, the, the total tour took two hours to do and yeah. it only stopped because you ran out of battery. This is absolutely the truth. Uh, the footage isn't any good, but the walk was fantastic. And the amount of stuff to talk about between the two. Um, I'm just glad you used that word too of, of awe, inspiration, amazement, astonishment, whatever you said, John. I feel like I have to, uh, I have to keep that very close to the vest in everything I do. And it's a, it's a shame. It's nice to be an audience of artists and people who appreciate um, the world for its astonishing character. So, because that's definitely how I feel about it. Please sign up for newsletters, follow Watermarks, follow Cities Living Laboratory, and please walk down Greenfield with your eyes open and walk into 2021 with your heart open. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye.